three seconds in this class. <laughs> we should just leave right now. Um, I believe we left off with page 66. I really wish these lights would come on, but there's no control for them. Um, with the wanderer, we think, saying, often alone in the first light of dawn, I've sung my lament, there is none living to whom I would dare to reveal clearly my heart's thoughts. I know it is true that it is a nobleman's lordly nature to closely bind his spirit's coffer, hold fast his treasure hoard, whatever he may think. And the reason I said the wanderer, we think, is because we get the first reference to the named wanderer in Leuze's translation back in line 9876, uh, where he capitalizes wanderer, with thus spoke, and the thus spoke can refer to either the previous speech or the following speech. It's unclear, okay? <clears throat> so, we're told in that those lines that I just read that whoever the speaker is, he says there's none living to whom he would now reveal what's in his heart, okay? And it's unclear exactly what that means because what are two possibilities? He either can't reveal it, why? Because they're dead, there's none now living, or he won't because possibly there's none that he trusts that much, okay? And then he gives us a statement. I know that it is true that, okay? And what comes after the that is a Poor Devon, because he's heard all this before. A gnomic passage, or it's also called a gnome. This is not one of those little things you put in a garden, you know, with the pointy head, that kind of thing. A gnomic passage, or a gnome, is um, wisdom literature, or a proverb an axiom, use whatever synonym you want for that. It is a truism, in other words. It's something that people accept to be true, okay? And what is it that he accepts to be true? That it's a nobleman's lordly nature to do what? to closely bind his spirit's coffer. The phrase there that is used for his spirit's coffer is in Old English, hoard coven, okay? Hoard, like hoard, okay? But this is like hoard coffin. So what's being hoard, hoarded in there? his hija mind. And this word can be variously translated. It can be mind, it can be spirit, it can be soul. Now, notice, in our terminology, in our modern day English lexicon, these are each pretty specifically different things. I mean, the mind is kind of where, if you were to position it in the body. Yeah, it's up here. Soul? Here, okay? So, here's the, here's the proverb. A lordly person, nobleman, does what? Keeps everything inside. Doesn't go around talking. And I, I very briefly the other day, you know, use the phrase, the British stiff upper lip kind of mentality. You, you, there used to be a cartoon strip, a comic strip, called Grin and Barrett. That's it. 
that mentality. You take everything life has to throw at you, and you get back up and dust yourself off and take another step forward. You just keep on going. It's the energizer bunny mentality in Anglo-Saxon England, essentially. Okay? Hold fast this treasure hoard. Notice, whatever he may think. Okay? Whatever's going on, you keep it close. Notice, whatever he may think implies, can mean what? Good stuff, bad stuff. This is kind of a, um, a Stoic notion. The Roman Stoics, the ancient Stoics, they essentially said, you know, you're going to suffer and you're going to enjoy in life. Your life's going to have its high points and it's going to have its low points. And then you're going to die. And when you die, you're, you is nothing. That's it. There's no afterlife. Okay? And they thought the whole point of life, or the whole purpose of life, is to find. So if you've, if you've got your high points and your low points, it's to do what? It's to find that even keel. It's to find that level of moderation. Why? So that you lower the high points and you raise the low points. That's how you don't suffer, essentially. Okay? So, the weary mind cannot withstand weird. Okay? Notice, it's not just the mind or the soul or the spirit cannot withstand weird. It's the weary mind. And the old English word is weary. It's the word from which we get modern English weary. It's exactly the same word. What are you when you are weary? Exhausted. I told my, my class yesterday, even though we'd met, yesterday was, yesterday was Wednesday, even though we'd met on Monday, I had talked about something the previous Wednesday, wasn't in class on Friday because of my mother-in-law stuff, um, and I said, you know, Last Monday, or excuse me, last Wednesday, a week ago, to me, seems like a year ago because of everything that's gone on in just in the last week. I mean, mine is just overflowing with crap kind of thing. That's what he's getting at. The mind that is so overwhelmed can't do what? Can't withstand weird. What will be? So what does it mean to withstand something? Yeah, which is kind of interesting when you think about those two words that make up that single word, withstand. Because with means what? Alongside. Alongside. Together. Stand. That kind of, you know, the metaphor that every political leader, every president, every prime minister uses when something really bad happens. We stand shoulder to shoulder with the Anglo-Saxon shield wall. But that's what that's kind of referring to. We stand with. The old English word with doesn't mean alongside. It doesn't mean together. It means against. Opposite to. And it's in that sense of the meaning that you have the word with and withstand. It's the only sense in the English language that it has the old English meaning. The old English word that we would say for together or alongside, that's mid. If you do something mid something, it's with modern English, with that person. So to withstand, Plant your feet, get in a fighting position, because that's what's going to happen. So the weary mind can't do what? It can't fight it. It says, I give. 
I give in the sense of, no. I give in the sense of, hit me, you fall, and then you get back up. The British stiff upper lip mentality, okay? It cannot withstand weird. The troubled heart can offer no help. So the weary mind can't oppose fate, if you want. The heart doesn't give any help. And so, this is all part of the, the known, by the way. And so, those eager for fame often bind fast in their breast coffers a sorrowing soul. Those eager for fame. What kind of fame? Like spoken about in songs, like they sing songs about you, they talk about you forever and ever and your great accomplishments. So what are your great accomplishments if you can't oppose fate? If you can't fight the world? Why do we read about Oedipus the king? You know, I mentioned Oedipus. Here. Why do we read about Oedipus? What, what does, if you've ever had any course in drama, hopefully you've read at least a little bit of Aristotle's little book on poetics, where he largely talks about what are the rules of drama. It's called poetics, but it's largely about drama, and more specifically about tragedy. Okay. In there, Aristotle focuses on Oedipus the king as the highest form of tragedy. And he says it essentially because of one reason. Oedipus takes everything that the world can throw at you, and he keeps going. Blinds himself, yes, at the end of the play. Why? Because he realizes he's blind. <laughs> he hasn't seen a thing. He thought he was a genius, dumber than a rock, essentially, okay? But he takes everything life can throw at him, fate, the gods, etc., and he doesn't give up. He keeps moving forward, okay? Suffering. That's why the end of the play, that's why the play ends with the chorus saying, count no man blessed until he is dead. Free of pain at last. Because within that ideology, within that system, and it, it comes out in the other Oedipus place too, you don't kill yourself. There are people who kill themselves in the Oedipus place. Oedipus's wife slash mother kills herself when she knows, he knows the truth. Why? It's not enough to just not be able to see. She can't face him anymore. She can't face the reality, okay? Then one of the other plays, somebody kills them. At the end of the third play, Oedipus at Colonus, third in the terms of chronology of Oedipus's life, okay? Oedipus dies. He dies a natural death. And the gods go, oh, no one has ever suffered like Oedipus has. Let's make him like us. And they apotheosoci, apoth whatever, they turn him into a god. As if the gods know diddly squat about suffering. Okay? Which is kind of you know part of the thing that's going on there. That's what's kind of getting at here. The fame, the fame is for those who have suffered and lived, kept going on. Okay. Just now we've left the gnomic passage. So the gnomic passage, it is a nobleman's lordly nature, blah, 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 blah. And it finishes just before the just. There's going to be a bunch of these gnomic passages, which is telling us this stuff is composed not only for entertainment. It's not only to, you know, light up the night in the hall when there's fires and there's beer drinking going on, to have a good time, it's also communicating a message to its audience. So you little lordly natures in training, young boys, young men who want to become a nobleman, 
Okay? Or want to become a Knigget, warrior, thane. Listen to what I'm telling you. All right? So, just as I have had to take my own heart, often wretched, cut off from my own homeland, far from my dear kinsmen. So, his heart, not literally, he's talking about himself, is wretched, cut off from his homeland, so he's not home. Wherever home is, which, and we don't know where that is, he's not there anymore. Far from his dear kinsmen, so he said to take his heart and do what? Bind it in fetters. Lock it up in a box. Ever since long ago, oh, now we get some backstory. Now we get some exposition of why this person is a wanderer or is in the reclastas path. The wretched exiles path. Ever since long ago, I hid my gold-giving friend. Now, the Old English there, because this is going to be kind of important. What line is that? That's line 22. Gold-giving friend. This is mine, mine, my gold friend, all right? Um, rock, rock, rock. Ever since I went to his gold-giving friend, in the darkness of earth in went wretched. He had to hide his gold-giving friend in the darkness of earth and go along wretchedly. So what's that gold-giving friend mean? His Lord. Remember when I talked about the Lord Thane relationship? Mm -hmm. And the Lord dispenses treasure upon return from a battle kind of thing? That is a metaphor that is used all the time. I don't mean literally always. It's used to oft, which you said, to describe one's Lord, a gold giving friend. Okay? What's the purpose of translation? Well, you have to interpret in order to translate, but what's the purpose of translating from one language to another? To share. To share, to make it so that if you don't know this language, you can still read it and, to, as Bean says, get the gist. The literal Old English is gold-giving friend. But does that mean as much to a modern English audience or English-speaking or reading audience? What is meant by that word? Several of you have used it. Lord. So why not translate that Lord? It's clearer. It is what is meant. See, the reason you have gold to giving friend in Old English is because of alliteration. And, and it could be a bunch of different, it could be treasure giving friend. Okay? Because the Old English for that line reads, Sithen yeara yeo gold wina mina. Yeara yeo. Those are uh -huh. And then the next line Did I miss something? I left off the Sithen because it's unimportant at the beginning. So this is the first half line. Pause, say sure. Second half line. If you watch the video where I talked about Old English alliteration pattern or looked at the handout that's on the um, on D2L under Old English stuff, the, I don't have time to go into this because it's too far behind. This g alliterates with y and y. These are called uh, palatal G's. And this is a, now we need to name the word. No, it's another word that, oh, we don't know. Kind of, but that's not the correct term. I can't think of what it is. But they alliterate, right? 
This is the word. This is the sound. It's the first stress syllable of the second half line that determines the alliteration for the entire line. So when the person's composing this, it's really difficult because they've got to look forward where they're going to make sure all the pieces fall into the right place, so to speak. Okay. My point is it, he doesn't need to have gold-giving friend in the modern English translation, though Liuza is trying to follow, as far as possible, the old English alliterative tradition. It's almost impossible in modern English, however, because we've lost a lot of native words because they've been replaced through Middle English with French words. All right? So, back to the poem. Long ago, he had to hide his gold-giving friend in the darkness of earth. What does that mean? He buried him. So what happened to his gold-giving friend? Died. Or was killed. And there's a difference between he died, passive tense, and was killed. It's more active. And went wretched, winter said, over the ice-locked waves, sought hall sick, that is, sick for a hall. Pining, longing for a hall. A treasure giver. What's meant by treasure giver? Another lord. Another lord. See, there's another word for it. Right? This one begins with a different sound. I think this is sink yeva, something like that. Treasure giver line 25. Sink is the brief time. Okay? So. Sought a new lord, a treasure giver, wherever I might find, far or near, someone in a meat hall who might know my people. So, <coughs> after he buried his lord, he left that place, he went out to find another hall. Why? Remember what I had up here and talked about the other day. The hall is what? Home. Keep going. Um, it's more than just home. Where you're from. Keep going. Keep going. It defines who you are. Without a hall, you're nobody. Or, or without a hall to be attached to. It's why when I mentioned you know, Socrates the other day, it's why Socrates would rather drink hemlock than leave Athens. Because for him, leaving Athens, you become a no one. At least I die a good, proud Athenian if I drink the hemlock. All right? So he goes off to seek a hall, a lord, someone, notice he says, who might know my people, who might have known my group. Or, possibly, who would want to comfort me, friendless, accustom me joy. That is, make me once again accustomed to joy. Someone who would kind of do what? Come on in. Open the door. There's an idea or an emphasis on hospitality here. The word in Greek is xinia. Not x or z. Xinia. All right? This idea of hospitality, it's in all the Indo-European peoples. It's in all of the literature. If you don't open your door in a cold winter night and it's storming and somebody's banging on your door, and you don't open that door and let that person in and give them refuge from the storm, ooh, bad stuff's going to happen to you. It's going to be really bad karma, all right? All the Indo-European languages have that mentality. He who has come to know how cruel, and here's another gnomic passage. So if you've experienced what I've experienced, what? He will understand the path of exile. So let me back up. He who has come to know how cruel a companion is sorrow for one with few dear friends. That few dear friends...
How many dear friends does this guy have after he buries his Lord and leaves his homeland? None. This is an example of litotes, which is exaggerated understatement. So, few dear friends means zero friends. We're going to find out. We're going to read a poem in a few days called The Dream of the Root about a guy who has a dream about the cross of Christ. And the cross of Christ speaks to him. And the cross is going to tell him that when Jesus is put in the grave, you know, he had little troops around him. Doesn't mean midgets. It means none. None of his things stayed around him. Because what happened after the crucifixion? <laughs> or at the crucifixion, all but one split. Okay? It's life to teens. It means he had zero. So, he who has come to know a cruel companion is sorrow for one with due dear friends. So, sorrow's pretty bad when you have friends, right? It's even worse when you don't have any. What are we told misery loves? Company. Company. Why? Yeah, because you can sit there and bitch and moan and whine with each other about, you know, how bad my life is or your life, etc. We'll, so the person who's been in this boat will understand the path of exile claims him. It's like it says, you're mine. Not patterned gold. A winter-bound spirit. Not the wealth of the earth. Okay? So notice, exile claims him in a winter, what's meant by winter bound? Heading towards death. Could be heading towards death. After all, winter's when nothing is living. It's, I think I used an example in here. It might have been one of my other classes. The other day, you know, the the Disney Winnie the Pooh cartoons, and the character of Eeyore, who always walks around in, in what goes with him, wherever he goes, a cloud in the rain. So he's walking, and that cloud is just always there. Not the wealth of earth. He remembers. The one who's been in my shoes remembers. Hall holders. Well, what's meant by hall holders? Yeah, it's kind of literally the warriors who live in the hall. And treasure taking, because the Lord is giving them treasure in the hall. How in his youth his gold giving Lord accustomed him to the feast. So the person who has been in my shoes will remember what it was like when he was young. Is that telling us anything about the age of the wanderer? If you say, in my youth, what does that imply? You're not 18, 19, 20, 22, 25. Okay? He's probably an old grizzled warrior. How in his youth, his gold-giving Lord accustomed him to the feast. What does it mean to accustom him to? We've already seen it used once before. Yeah. In other words, the speaker is saying, my Lord really liked me. He's like, no, no, no. You take the, take the front seat. Take the front row. Okay? And so, now notice what the way it's presented in your text. Okay? You not only have a break in quote unquote stanzas, you have what? You've got a white space. Okay? Now, I don't usually talk about, you know, <laughs> printing rhetoric, so to speak, but I'm going to step out on a limb here. When a text gives you a visual break like that, is that saying anything? As they're doing this, what's it saying? There's a pause there. It, it's like the speaker kind of stopped for a moment. 
gathers himself, takes a drink of water, beer, whatever. And so, he who has long been forced to undergo his Lord's beloved words of counsel will understand. Notice, who has long been forced to undergo his Lord's beloved words of counsel will understand. It's like you had no choice. You had to understand and learn this these words of counsel. He'll understand what? When sorrow and sleep both together often bind up the wretched exile, meaning not necessarily when he dies, when sorrow and sleep together bind. You go to sleep full of sorrow, wake up and it's not any better when they often bind up the wretched exile it seems in his mind okay so we've not woken up yet it seems in his mind that he clasps and kisses his lord of men and on his knee he lays hands and head as he sometimes long ago in earlier days enjoyed the gift throne So how does it seem in his mind, this instant? What do you do when you go to sleep? Usually. Dream. This is usually read, often read, as he's talking about dreaming. Dreaming what? That he clasps and kisses his Lord of men. They're European. You know, American men don't go up and give each most don't go up and give each other hugs. And don't give, you know, a kiss on this side of the face and a kiss on this side of the face. You know, if you're Greek or Russian, it's three kisses. Here, here, and back or French, and back over to here. Okay? America. Okay. This is not that. This is a welcoming hug and kiss. And on his knee lays his hands and head. Why would you lay your hands and head on somebody's knee? That's an act of supplication. So what do you do when you supplicate someone? You're asking for a favor. You're asking for a benefit. You're asking for a grace. Remember that word R? And I translated it. Favor, mercy, grace, or it could be, you know, earthly prosperity. You have that in the Old Testament when someone is going to receive a blessing, like when Jacob and Esau go to their father Isaac, they each, you know, put their hands on their father's knees. When Jacob later on will give his blessing to his children, same kind of thing. You have it in classical literature. When someone goes up to another person and falls down on their knees and claps the other person around the knees, they're essentially begging for mercy. Tolkien even uses it in The Lord of the Rings. There's a scene where uh, Gollum goes up to Frodo and very gently puts his hand on, Go on Frodo's knee. And the narrator gives us this wonderful description. And then Sam wakes up and you know, breaks the image. All right? So, and lays his hands and heads on his Lord's knee as he sometimes long ago in earlier days enjoyed the gift throne. And you've got a gloss about gift throne. Okay. The description seems to be some sort of ceremony of loyalty, charged with intense regret and longing. I, mean, I don't know about the regret. I don't see the regret at all. Because regret implies what? Yeah, or you've done something wrong. Okay. Nothing here implies regret unless... You're really reading that into the clasping and putting your head on the knee. Like, I've done something wrong, be merciful to me. That's the only possibility, I think. All right? But when the friendless man awakens again. So this happens in his sleep. And notice what in his sleep occurs. What does he do? He remembers...
back when he had everything. And he's lying there in his little coracle, little boat, you know, like one eye wakes up, and he looks around, and what's he see? Endless ocean. Not the Lord, not the hall, not the singer with the harp, not steins of beer, you know, being passed around. What does he see? The fallow waves, seabirds bathing, spreading their feathers, frost falling and snow, mingled with hail. And then what happens? The heart's wounds are that much heavier longing for his loved one. Because he wakes up and he realizes, damn, it was all a dream. I'm not here anymore. <laughs> I'm here. Sorrow is renewed. Why renewed? Because it was gone for a few moments <laughs> when he had the dream. How many of you have woken up from a dream before? And as you're waking up, you're like, no, 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 because the dream's, you know, flitting away. When the memory of kinsmen flies through the mind. Notice, that is what renews the sorrow. Because the memory's telling him, it was real. What I had before was real. And what he has now is also real. Which of the two reals would he rather have? The previous one. He greets them with great joy. He greets who with great joy? Notice, when the memory of kinsmen flies through the mind, he greets them with great joy. Greedily surveys hall companions. They always swim. Who's swimming away? His hall companions? The floating spirits bring too few familiar voices. Cares are renewed for one who must send over and over a weary heart across the binding waves. Now the way many scholars read those lines that I've just read is he wakes up, he has the memory of his Lord, and then he has the memory of kinsmen. And this memory flies through the mind. Think of the passage in Bede, the sparrow flying. Okay. And he greets them with joy. In, in his mind, what many scholars suggest is that at this point, the speaker, the rememberer, is hallucinating. He sees something, and his mind's playing tricks on him so that what he sees isn't what he literally sees. Because what he literally is seeing are ocean birds. But what his mind does is he turns those birds, his mind turns those birds into images of kinsmen. It's like he sees, well, there's Fred, there's George, there's Tom. And what do they do? They float away. Notice the floating spirits bring too few familiar voices. Why? Because when they speak, it's not, how you doing, Mark? <laughs> or wanderer. Cares are renewed. For one who must send over and over a weary heart across the binding waves. The grammar and reference of this intense, almost hallucinatory scene is not entirely clear. Translation reflects one commonly proposed meaning. Notice, uh, excuse me, reading, because what do translations again do? I'm going to beat this horse till there's no skin left on it. You're interpreting. Okay? So this is one interpretation. And so I cannot imagine for all this world why my spirit should not grow dark when I think through all this life of men. How suddenly they gave up the hall floor, mighty young retainers. 
Pause for a minute. Okay. So, you get that recount, those images recounted, and then visually on the page, you have that white space, right? And I think that white space actually does suggest something. There's a pause. There's a big break. So we're going to take another pause, big break, and go back for a moment to something we started to talk about the other day, but I didn't really get to until I got to my second class, Tuesday. You know, we, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the opening line. Longing for mercy, the aria yibidith, longing for experiencing, awaiting, or expecting. And I suggested how you translate that is key to the rest of the poem. I'm going to give you a specific example. Okay. If you translate that, always the one alone experiences mercy, the maker's mildness, what does that do for the rest of the poem? As opposed to always the one alone longs for. Well, it kind of sets up the poem for me to think that what I'm experiencing now is so horrible that something else would be preferable if he's longing for mercy. Whereas if he's experiencing it, then mercy is preferable. Yes. You're. 99.9 .9 of where I want you to be. I mean, I think you're actually 100% there. It's just different wording. Uh, an experience, it kind of makes it seem like the same thing that's a happy day. Uh, a longing kind of makes it seem like Okay. Okay. And I, why do you suggest it's going to be a happy ending? Because what's understood by that, what are you implying, or I mean, that's the rest of you. What is he implying about the idea of mercy? What does it result in? The happy ending, the, the better than this. Okay? Uh, trying to think how to talk, how to mention this. Generally speaking, so there are some exceptions, traditional Christian theology would say, that's not really the understanding of mercy. Mercy isn't just, you know, the happy ending. Mercy is when someone or something is in your power, and your power involves judgment, and you don't pronounce that judgment. That is, you don't, you know, you don't do the bad thing to them. All right? What if the mercy, the understanding of mercy is... Okay, go back to the line. Always the one alone experiences mercy, the, mayor, the maker's mildness. And every, if that's the proper translation, then one way of reading that is that everything that happens in the rest of the poem is what? Exactly. It is the mercy that this person needs. Why? Because the mercy that I need is not the mercy that you need. Why? Different shoes. I'm not wearing her shoes. She's not wearing my shoes. We each walk our own, we each have our own baggage. We each have our own backgrounds. So mercy takes what? All different forms. It's individual. It's totally unique. And for this person, the things it could be read this way. The things that happen to him are what is merciful for him. In other words, it, for, to get to language that's going to be used at the end of the poem, for his salvation, his Lord and kin all needed to die. Notice, that's not saying anything about quote-unquote within traditional Christian theology, their salvation. That's a totally different poem. Because each one, totally different poem. Why? As Shakespeare says, our life is what? Like an 
actor on a stage. We each have our own place, so to speak. Okay. Now go back to... So I, I wanted to emphasize that idea that this and everything that's happening to him might be the mercy that he's experiencing. Only problem is, from our perspective, what's life often look like? Thomas Hobbes said it in the 17th century. Poor, nasty, brutish, and short. In other words, it sucks. I mean, yeah, there's some good points. There's some, there's some of these high points, right? But then, we're going to talk about Fortune's wheel a little bit later. Fortune turns her wheel, we're up here, we're at the top, everything's going great, you know? And then, it turns, and we're down in the dumps. I, mean, I can't tell you the number of accounts I've read of people who, you know, people are found homeless, and then somebody starts talking to them and find out the guy who is homeless used to run a million dollar, you know, business. Or, you know, has, was a doctor, or hedge fund trader, etc. And is now living under a bridge somewhere. Well, that's, you know, fortune's wheel turning, okay? So, after the pause, and so I cannot imagine for all this world why my spirit should not grow dark. Why shouldn't I get depressed? Why shouldn't I say, this life sucks? It's horrible. When I think through all this life of men, how suddenly they gave up the hall floor mighty young retainers. They gave up the hall floor. That's a metaphor. What's it mean? They died. That's a, they, they left the hall. The hall there becomes a metaphor for life. Who left the hall floor? The mighty young retainers. Why shouldn't I think Germanic pagan mythology there is no future. There's nothing after this. When I think of all these mighty young men who died. Thus this middle earth droops and decays every single day. What does that mean? Droops and decays every single day. If it drooped and decayed yesterday, then yesterday it was here. If it drooped and decays again today, then what does that imply? It's drooping a little more from here, so it's now here. And tomorrow it's going to be here, tomorrow it's going to be here. In other words, idea of progress? Uh -uh. It's regress. Life gets worse and worse, and then you die. How are we doing mentality-wise here? Is this, you know, yay! Smile in the morning when you wake up, you know. And so a man cannot become wise. Notice, not will not, cannot, before he has weathered his share of winters in this world. What does it mean, weathered his share of winters? Hardship, what else? You can't become wise until you've had a few years go under your belt. Kind of implying, till you get old. A wise man, notice, tons of gnomic passages. A wise man must be patient. What's it mean to be patient? Long suffering, good biblical term there. What else does it mean? Waiting without complaint, without grumbling. What are you when you are a patient? Like in a hospital. Mm -hmm. You're ill. You're sick. You're suffering. Notice that waiting for, without complaining, comes from the same word. <laughs> they both mean to suffer, to endure. So when you tell a 10-year-old kid a week before Christmas and the Christmas tree is loaded with gifts, only child, you know. I've known a few only children. I'm the youngest of five, you know, four kids. 
Some of you might be only children. I'm not casting aspersions. The one in particular that I'm thinking of, kid, was spoiled out the wazoo. I'm actually two, now that I think of them. I mean, Christmas tree, just, you know, Dudley Dursley kind of, you know, spoiled. Don't touch. Be patient. What are you really telling that child? Yeah, suffer. <laughs> you got to wait. It's like putting a plate of cookies in milk and saying, ah, ah, ah. that's cruel. It's cruel and unusual punishment, all right? So. So it's akin to passion. Oh, very much. What kind of passion? Yes, like the passion of the Christ. It's the suffering of that word passion, that passio means to undergo. Okay? You don't say, you know, um, you know, you have to undergo your wedding. Most people go, you look forward to it, right? I mean, it's a good thing. For some, not so much. Um, so a wise man must be patient, neither too hot-hearted nor too hasty with words. What does it mean, hot-hearted? Hot-hearted. Could be angry. I heard a couple of you talking about Shakespeare when you came in. Hopefully you're going to read one of the Henry IV plays. Shakespeare creates the character. Don't tell me no. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's in the wrong you know, class or you're reading the 17th century plays or something like that. Shakespeare has the character of Hotspur, based on a real character. But he names him Hotspur. Why? Oh boy, this guy's got a short... You say anything about his manhood, his honor, and he's ready to run you through. Okay, So that's what's meant by too hot-hearted or hasty with words. Hasty with words also means... I shouldn't do this, but... I don't care your politics. You should have never had my politics. Donald Trump. What do I mean by that? Notice I did this. <laughs> Say something, I'm going to tweet. You know, now that he, I think, no, he's not back on Twitter yet. Whatever. Uh, whatever comes in his head, it's out there. Don't bring the words. Yeah. You, mm, filter. You don't mm, shut it. Okay, nor too weak in war, nor too unwise in thoughts. Notice, too weak. It's okay to be relatively weak in, what does that mean by weak in war? Run away, run away, Monty Python, you know, the French kind of thing? No. It's judicious. Another Shakespeare. It's Falstaff. Discretion is the better part of it. Did you have me for intro to Shakespeare? I did. You did not. Okay. Um, okay. Nor too unwise in thoughts, neither fretting nor fawning nor greedy for wealth. What does that mean? Fretting for wealth, worrying about your bank account, fawning over it, you know, <laughs> model buying, you know, kind of a thing, nor too greedy. For it. Never eager for boasting before he truly understands. What does that mean, never eager for boasting before you truly understand? Again, I, I use a lot of political examples. Doesn't matter what your politics are. You're gonna get you're not gonna like me for a wide variety of reasons. Okay. <clears throat> If President Assad, Assyria, crosses this line, we're going to, President Obama back in like 2012 or so, and what did President Assad do? What do you mean? This line right here? <laughs> he just ran right over it. What did the United States do? Zilch, not a zip. Okay? That was boasting. Or a presidential candidate. Elect me... And I'm going to solve all the problems. There won't be... Liar. <laughs> okay? That's boasting in words. Notice. Before he truly understands. T 
truly understands what? The real nature, is it snow? It is snow. Yeah. Real nature of, prob of the problem. So, oh, there's a dragon there? I'll go out and fight that dragon. Mono a Draco, you know, me and the dragon. Oh, and then the person goes, that's a big dragon. I thought you meant like a little baby. Okay. Or the national debt is much worse than I thought it was. Or the problem with federal spending is much greater than I thought. I didn't know about these other. So you make all kinds of promises slash boast. You get elected and then, oops. <laughs> I have to retract that or I have to modify. That's what the speaker means. It's not that it's bad to boast. It's that you better be prepared to follow up on that boast. A man must wait, notice, when he makes a boast until the brave spirit, the part of him that wants to really boast, can do what? truly understands where the thoughts of his heart will turn. Meaning, when he's put into the situation he's boasting about, he'll, what's the thought of his heart truly turn? Will he stand firm? Will he really do what he said he'll do? I think Tolkien kind of bases a character in The Lord of the Rings. Partially, at least, on this. The character, it's really coming out. The character of Faramir, which, if you're familiar with the Lord of the Rings films, hopefully you aren't, Peter Jackson just totally bastardizes. It's horrible. The character of Faramir is dominated by one thing. In the book, he is a Anglo-Saxon wanderer-type warrior. If he makes a boast, he'll do it. If he makes a promise, he'll do it, no matter what. And in the novel, he's, you know, he says, I don't know what this thing is that you're carrying, but whatever it is, I wouldn't stoop to the ground to pick it up off the road if I knew what it was. All right? And then later on, he finds out what it is. You know, it's the one thing that will give him all the power in the world. And he says, I told you I wouldn't stoop to the ground to pick it up. That oath binds me. That's what this character is talking about. All right? The wise man must realize how ghastly it will be when all the wealth of the world stands waste. What does that mean when all the wealth of the world stands waste? When it's not worth anything. Economic crash could be that. What else could it be? End of the world. Yeah, end of the world. What, what, all the good things are gone. All the good things are gone. End of the world. Judgment day, you know. Fire and brimstone. Or maybe it's not judgment day. Maybe it's the caldera beneath Yellowstone National Park burps. It seems like judgment day. Dead, yeah, you know. Especially if you live in Shoshone or Cody, Wyoming or, you know, Murfreesboro. Because we'd be gone too within a few days. Well, not only that, but it would probably bury most of the United States in several hundred feet if it were like the previous, previous eruption, several hundred thousand years ago. Okay, so. Yeah, we're going to get to that, and we're going to get to that in a moment. When all the wealth of this world stands waste, the old English word that's used for waste there—that's what line seventy-four. Oh, it is actually. I thought it was another word. That is actually the word wasta. Okay? So, worthless. Destroyed, if you want. As now. So that's in the future. The wise man must realize how ghastly it will be. It will be when all the wealth of the world stands waste. Notice he's saying, if you're going to be wise... You must understand when, now, how that will be in the future, okay? 
as now, here and there throughout this middle earth, walls stand blasted by wind, beaten by frost, the buildings crumbling. And some of us read that as the poet slash speaker is making a reference to, for example, Roman ruins. See, the Anglo-Saxons, the Germanic tribes, they built entirely out of timber. Romans built stone. And probably when some of those Anglo-Saxon tribes, when they moved in and everything, and started conquering and moving west, you know, some of them got down to London and saw the Roman wall and saw buildings. And they got to the city of Bath. And they saw these massive baths made out of stone. And they're like, who in the world? Humans can't make this. And so they referred to those kinds of things as, and we're going to see it in just a moment, into your work. The work of giants. Giants had to make that. How else can you move them? Big old rocks, you know, stones and stuff. Stonehenge, for example. Okay? <clears throat> so he's talking about buildings that still partially survive. The wine halls topple. Say, so this is all prefaced with the wise man must what? Must understand what it's going to be like in the future. Just as now, you can go and you can look at these buildings. And the ruins of these buildings are what? For the people of the past. Their future. Where are the people of the past? <laughs> Dead. Okay? The wine halls topple, their rulers lie, deprived of all joy. It's a nice euphemism, being dead. The proud old troops all fell by the wall. Notice they died defending the wall and everything the wall suggests, the hall behind it and such. And then we find out how some died. War carried off some, okay, sent them on the way, that is, you know, they one, a bird carried off over the high seas. One, the gray wolf shared with death. And one, a sad-faced man covered in an earthen grave. So why the bird and the wolf? The bird is probably an eagle. These are what are called the beasts of battle. Why? They're eating what's left. So it doesn't mean a bird literally picks up a corpse, because that would be a very big bird. None big enough around, unless it's a baby, you know. It, what do birds go for first? You hang somebody, capital punishment, and you leave them hanging, often part of capital punishment, you leave them hanging until the corpse is picked clean. What do scavengers go for first? Fingers? Skin, eyes, live, soft and gooey, easy to get, okay? So pick an eye, get the body open, pick a liver, you know, etc. And one, a sad-faced man covered in an earthen grave. Who might that refer to? The speaker. He might be describing what? Proud old warriors died. The young guys were slaughtered quickly. The proud old warriors died defending the wall, and he, we don't know how, somehow survived. Now, I've had students suggest he was a coward, he was a traitor, he ran away. Very unlikely. Could be he's just the last survivor. He's so tough. It's almost impossible to kill them, you know. The creator of men thus destroyed. The Old English. Yeah, Yelda Shippen. Yelda, the eldest kind of a man. Shippen. Shaper. 
the shaper of men. So the user translates that creator. The creator of man thus destroyed this walled city. Wait, God did it? God, you know, like Sodom and Gomorrah? You know, nuclear cloud and stuff? How, how did God do this? Louder? It is what it is. It is what it is, but it's not weirda that's used. Okay? Go back and reread, if you've never read it, by, you know, today's what, Thursday? Or do, do this by Tuesday. Go back and reread the Old Testament. Pardon? Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be on a quiz. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. Go back and reread the Old Testament. And what happens throughout the Old Testament, beginning with Genesis and ending with Malachi? The entire history of the Old Testament is God chooses the people. He tells the people what to do. If they do what he tells them to do, they'll receive blessing, and et cetera, et cetera. And if they don't, then they'll be punished. Rinse, repeat. That's what happens. What the entire book of Judges is about. They get a judge. The judge tells them this is what God wants us to do. They follow him for a while. And then they say, we like what those people over there are doing. We want to live like them. They fall away. They fall under subjugation. Or they're destroyed. They're captured 400 years in Egypt. They're led back out. They follow God for a while. They fall away. It just goes on again and again. And we're told by the prophets throughout the Old Testament. Oh yeah, when Nebuchadnezzar took control, guess what? Nebuchadnezzar was an agent of God. Pharaoh was an agent of God. What's God doing? He's trying to get your attention. That's it. Thus, what? The creator of men destroyed this walled city. I think that's just reflecting this biblical Old Testament mentality. It is, and it's even used this way in the Old Testament, it is the mercy of God. Because he wants, ultimately what? To bring the lost sheep back. And sometimes you got to bring some wolves in to get the lost sheep to come back. Until the, there it is, the end of your work, the old works of giants stood empty. And the word there for empty is the word that I think Devon was getting at earlier, that I thought was actually there, but it was waste. Edel. Modern English. Reverse that. Idol. The old works of giants stood idle. What's the difference between idle and empty? Idle is waiting. Idle is waiting. What else? If you're idling a car, do you have? Is there a reason you're doing that? Well, if you're waiting, what's the reason? In other, there's still a destination, there's still a purpose involved. Empty? What, how do you represent empty? Zero. <laughs> Zilch. Not, there's no point to emptiness, so to speak. It's nothing, right? There's a difference there. The old works of giants stood. See, I like idol better. Because what's the old work of giants? It's these old towns, these old cities. Stonehenge. Stonehenge doesn't sit empty. We might not know what Stonehenge means, but you can be damn sure the people who put those big rocks on top of those other big rocks, they had a reason for doing that. They didn't wake up one Saturday and go, this sounds fun. yeah, I think we should go dig some 20-ton stones from Wales, transport them 180 miles, and dig big pits and make this thing so that people 5,000 years from now will go, hmm, I wonder what it means. 
<laughs> yeah, the ultimate trolling, okay? There's a reason for it. It's not empty, okay? They stood idle. Idle implies there's a purpose, okay? Without the sounds of their former citizens. And that's getting at the purpose. What is the purpose of a city, a town, a village? It's community. It's people living in relationship. The purpose of every built now, well, shouldn't say every, because we're in one of the most god awful buildings ever constructed <laughs> on the face of the earth. This building is an example of what's called the Court of Bodies Pierre. Brutalist architecture. <laughs> it's an actual name of the school, not school like a building, but a movement of architecture from the 50s and 60s. Look at the, uh, what is it, the FBI building in Washington. Fits. <laughs> it's designed to do what? To brutalize. It kills the spirit. I mean, this building, I mean, wow. If there should be a beautiful building on campus, it should be a liberal arts building. A music building, theater, it shouldn't be business or aerospace or construction, concrete management. Really, this should be concrete management. Anyway. So, he who deeply considers with wise thoughts. So, you got to deeply think about it. You have to be wise. The foundation, excuse me, this foundation. What do you mean by this foundation? Hey, everything I've just been talking about. This is the base. This is the groundwork. All right? In this dark life, old in spirit. Notice the speaker is suggesting you don't have to be physically old. In other words, you don't literally have to be in your 61. You don't literally have to be in your 60s kind of to be wise. I've known people in their 20s who are very wise. Why? Because of the lives they've had to live. I've known people in their 60s about as wise as this water bottle who just don't learn. I mean, the wall is hard, right? And they'll just keep bumping their head into it, thinking, well, at some point, there's going to be a door there. And no. Often remembers so many ancient slaughters. Okay? And says these words, lines 92, the Old English. This is what's called, my next class is going to come in and they're going to go, what does all this mean? <laughs> this is called the Ubisunt motif. Where are? It's Latin for where are. Famous song, 60s, Peter, Paul, and Mary, where have all the flowers gone? And it's about the Vietnam War. And the flowers are young men who've been drafted to Vietnam and slaughtered in the meat grinder. The translation, where is the horse gone? Where is the rider? Where is the giver of gold? Where are the seats of the feast? Where are the joys of the hall? The Old English, where come mare? Where come, where come madu? Where come madum yeva? Where come simbla yesetu? Where sinden saladremas? Tolkien uses almost the exact same words in The Lord of the Rings. When a few of the characters get towards the tall, the, the hall of Aderas, or, or Medusel. And Aragorn recites lines very similar to this when they go around a gravesite. Okay? Where are the riders? Where are the horses? Where are the givers? Where have they gone to? Think of the Germanic mythology that the priest says. This is what we know right now, this little bit of life. We don't know what happens after. So the speaker says, the wise person will remember these words, thinking of ancient slaughters. So thinking of, where did the dead people go? 
Oh, the bright cup, oh, the brave warrior, oh, the glory of princes, how the time passed away, slipped into nightfall. And this is the kicker, as if it had never been. What's that mean, as if it had never been? Shakespeare's going to do the same kind of idea in one of his songs. What is one thing, whether you acknowledge it or not, you will acknowledge it at some point in the future. What is one thing everyone wants to know about the world after one is dead? About the world. Bingo. How you'll be remembered. If you'll be remembered. Did you leave a mark? Do you have children? Will your children live on after you? And we can get all sappy syrupy and go, oh, and you'll live on through them. And, okay? It's as if they had never been. I mean, just let your mind wrap around that for a moment. That's pretty, it's pretty bleak. <laughs> It could be any time of the day, and it'd still be too early for that. <laughs> right. okay. There still stands in the path of the dear warriors a wall wondrously high with serpentine stains. The stains aren't important. It, the wall is still there. Where are the people who built it? I mean, we've got artifacts today. We don't know what they mean. We don't know who made them. And people are like, hmm. That's so you have crazies go. Aliens. <laughs> A storm of spears took away the warriors. Bloodthirsty weapons. Notice the weapons are bloodthirsty, not the warriors who wielded them. It's like the weapons go, yes, I want to soak up your blood into my steel. Which is why, I'm going to make all kinds of references to Tolkien, because he was an Anglo-Saxonist. This fills his words. And Tolkien, in one of his stories in the Silmarillion, has a sword that speaks. And the sword talks about the blood it will take. Bloodthirsty weapons, weird the mighty. What will be, will be the mighty. It can't be opposed. In storms batter these stone walls, frost, frost falling binds up the earth, the howl of winter when blackness comes, night's shadow looms. And the old English is really more like night's shadow shadows. It just gets darker and darker. Sends down from the north harsh hailstones in hatred of men. Pretty bleak, right? Where, where are we if we're in a depressed mindset here? It's like, it's out, it's loaded, I've cocked it, it just push me a little bit more. All is toilsome in the earthly kingdom. Notice, not oft, <laughs> not most, all. The working of Reard changes the world under heaven. Where does Weird hold sway? Down here. Weird doesn't affect heaven. Okay? Let me just make sure. 107. Is that? Yep, and that word is heaven. It's not the skies. <laughs> it's heaven. Okay. Here, wealth is fleeting. That word for fleeting? Lana. It's the word from which we get lean, and it's related to the word from which we get loan. Here, wealth is fleeting, temporary, right? <laughs> How many of you realize that? 
you get paid and then where'd it go? It's gone. Okay? Or loaned. Because you get paid and then you pay somebody else. Here, friends are fleeting. Transitory. Here, man is fleeting. Here, woman is fleeting. All the framework of this earth will stand. It's that same word that we saw earlier that he also translates empty, idol. It has a purpose. I mean, if, if say we pointed the James Webb telescope at a known exoplanet, and we discovered something that is definitely not, quote unquote, natural, like a skyscraper. What would one assume? One, we're not alone. Two, something made that. What would we then need to determine? What was it that was made? If I were to come in here one day and say, tell me what you see, not tell me what it is. Just tell me what you see. You would all probably describe something and maybe at times you would see a sunset kind of thing. But if I brought in something none of you knew what it was and said, tell me what you see, what would you tell me? You might describe its color and its shape, but you wouldn't be able to tell me what it is. Why? Because you wouldn't know its purpose. Here, all the framework of this earth, in other words, this world entirely is idle. It still has purpose. Okay. It's just not fulfilled yet. So said the wise man, sitting apart in meditation. <laughs> Is this the same guy who thus spoke? He is good who keeps his word. And the man who never too quickly shows the anger in his breast, unless he already knows the remedy a noble man can bravely bring about. That's the whole thing about don't boast until you know how your heart will respond when you find yourself in that situation. So he is good who keeps his word, that is, who fulfills his boast. Kind of. You've got a gloss down there. Keeps faith. Yeah, the Old English is actually uh, 112 or so. Till this saith that his trela yehaldeth, who holds his truth, his pledge, his faith, his loyalty, all right? It will be well for one who seeks mercy, consolation from the Father in heaven, where for us all stability stands. Now, there are several Old English scholars who think this last portion from line 111 on, is not original to the poem. They think that's a later interpolation. That the poem gets composed, and some monk is copying it, and the monk reads, here a woman is fleeting, all the framework of this earth will stand empty. And he goes, well, it's not very Christian. That sounds very existentialist. You know, like it could have been written in 1970 or 60 or 50 or part of, you know, waiting for Godot. No, 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 no. No, I got to Jesify it. I got to I gotta add some hope to it. So trust in Jesus. I don't think that's accurate at all. I, this mentality at the very end is woven throughout. And I think it's because, and this is my interpretation, because of how I interpret Ara Yibidah. I think it is experiences, mercy, and everything that flows is part of that. But notice what the poet ends with. I mean, what does he say about life on this world? It's harsh, right? It's not easy. Why? Everything changes. Everything changes daily. You want stability? You want permanence? You want unchangingness? Where does he say to look for it? Not here. 
How, how do we try to make things permanent in our lives? How do we stop bad things from happening? Hire a police force, have a standing army, buy insurance. What's the purpose of insurance? So that when the bad things do happen, you're taken care of. What's the purpose of a retirement account? So that when you're old and nearly dead, you still have money in the bank that you can then pat. <clears throat> it's all an attempt to overcome weird. What will be, will be down here. Where how do you really overcome weird? Up there, where there's permanence and stability. All right, we'll stop there. Seafarer for whatever that day is. Next week, Tuesday. So we're one day behind. Probably get more behind after this. Um, I'm going to put up another quiz. Maybe two. Uh, haven't finished grading the one that was due last night. I didn't stay up until midnight to do so. Um, that will probably cover some more of the background stuff. Definitely the Wanderer. There will be an email. Have a good weekend.